Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Board of Syndicast, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to this notable shareholders meeting. Um, I feel very privileged to come back to the land of my forefathers, not from the Vikings of the Middle Ages, but me more more who was Swedish and born in Bromma. So it's very nice to come back to Stockholm, to a city that I've been to many times before and love very much. But I'm not here to talk about my family. Uh, I'm here to talk about energy and the foundry industry. Um, and not about having lots of energy, but trying to reduce energy for a more sustainable world. Uh, my philosophy, wouldn't it be nice? We all understand when we buy our white goods, and our products from the department stores, that we have an energy rating, uh, which is, if you see in my front slide, this thing on the left-hand side. This is an energy rating European standard. It would be nice if we could do this for all our manufacturing plants, for everything that we make. And we don't currently do this for our plants. We do it for buildings, certainly in the UK. <coughs> I suspect we do, you do in Sweden too. But for our manufacturing plants and our processes, we don't do this. And I think that's a real opportunity for the future. And the way I look at these things at the university where I work is to look at flows of energy, flows of materials. And I also look at best practice um, and clean uh, manufacturing plants and, and very efficient manufacturing plants. On the right-hand side there, you'll see an example of possibly one of the uh, best users of energy in, um, in, in foundries that I've come across, which is a, a Swedish plant up in Schöfte. Uh, unfortunately, the, the planners didn't understand that you could manufacture uh, cast iron without having too many emissions, and so they forced the, the, the plant in uh, Schöfte to put a chimney on the building. Uh, that chimney is now up for sale for anybody who wants to go bungee jumping down a 100-meter-high uh, three meter diameter tube uh, because it's actually unused as a chimney, which is fantastic. And I think if we can get that message across to society that foundries can be this clean and this energy friendly, then the business that we're in will be very productive in the future. So I work at Cranfield University and many of you, I suspect most of you will not have heard of Cranfield University. We're an exclusively postgraduate university. We don't have undergraduates, which means I don't have to do any babysitting of 18-year-olds, which I most appreciate. I work with people who really want to learn. They're mainly more mature by the time they get to work with me than many university professors. So I'm very lucky, and we have a very good reputation in terms of where we deliver. We're very much into technology and management, and we believe that we have a fantastic impact and influence. We're a premier learning institution in the UK and the world. And we do transformational research for industry and for, the, uh, for other sectors rather than just education. Where is Cranfield? I've been asked several times since I've been here. Uh, most people have never heard of where it is, even if they've heard of it. We are halfway between Cambridge and Oxford, which is a very good position to be, uh, which means we're extremely well situated for London, very good transport links. Uh, if anybody's heard of Milton Keynes, then we're very close to Milton Keynes. I live in Milton Keynes, and it's a, a very modern city. Uh, and Bedford was the home of John Bunyan, for those of you who ha may have a, a religious bent. So... Uh, we're a very interesting campus. That's the campus. We have our own airport. So we're one of two universities that I know of around the world that has its own airport. We run it as a private concern. It's actually, uh, un it's actually owned by the university. We have a large amount of impact and influence around the world. We work with well over 750 businesses and governments, and we work in the areas of aerospace and transport systems, where we work strategically with the MOD, uh, sorry, with uh, p companies like Airbus and BAE Systems, Boeing, Bombardier, and Rolls-Royce, in defense and security, which is actually not based on the Cranfield campus, but based near Oxford, uh, we, we have a, ma a very major contract with the MOD, 
uh, to carry out both training and research for uh, uh, military. We also work in water, environment and energy and uh, work with both water companies and DEFRA in the UK and governments around the world in influencing water policies. Our management and leadership through the School of uh, Management uh, has one of the very first MBAs that was developed in the UK and is ranked very, very highly amongst MBAs in the world, uh, in the top three, in fact. And manufacturing, which is where I reside, uh, we are leading some very large research centres in partnership with the with other universities, but we are leading them, and we run them for the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, which is our government-funded body in the UK. Those are the sorts of companies we work with, as you can see, multiple large names that I'm sure you've all heard of, like Siemens, HP, McLaren, Rolls-Royce, BAE Systems, Kinetic, Bombardier, GKN, etc., etc. In terms of our transformational research, we are one of the top five UK research-intensive universities in terms of research income uh, as a ratio, as a proportion of turnover. And the other four are Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial College and University College London. So we are in with the big five. We really are a very, very uh, um, inf uh, intensive, research-intensive university and influential. 81% of our research is world-leading or internationally excellent as determined by our research excellence framework in 2014, uh, where the UK government actually assesses all universities. In terms of our mechanical, aeronautical and manufacturing engineering uh, research, from the QS uh, tables, they, they have uh, league tables uh, around the world. QS is one of the major league tables that uh, people look at to, in terms of making the decisions as to where they want to go and study. Um, we are number four in the UK in this area, number 10 in Europe, and 27th in the world, which is not bad when you think about how many universities there are in the world if you add all the Chinese ones in. So, We have some unique facilities. We have the National Centre for Surface Engineering, uh, where we develop things like thermal barrier coatings for turbine blades, we have a precision engineering laboratory where we can machine uh, across a space of one and a half meters to a tolerance of something like 10 nanometers, which is pretty fantastic if you know anything about machining. We do additive layer manufacturing. We have one of three crash impact centers, which is certified by the FIA for Formula One crash testing of cars. Um, that's actually shown in the center here. Uh, we also have a national wind tunnel facility, which is shown here. And we have the facility for airborne atmospheric measurements, which is used uh, internationally. In other words, it's a flying laboratory which goes up and uh, tests whether the atmosphere has got pollutions in it, pollution in it, or even pot potentially <coughs> volcanic ash so that airplanes can't fly, for example. Uh, so Cranfield was rung up as soon as the Icelandic volcano erupted and we sent planes up to measure the atmospheric pollution of that um, volcano. We also have something called the National Reference Centre for Soils, uh, which means that we can develop soil, we can, we can look at all, all the soils across the UK. We have uh, samples of soils, I think it's every kilometre of uh, soil uh, around the UK. Uh, but we've also worked in that centre for developing soils for things like... Uh, the Martian rover uh, or the uh, vehicles for space where we can, we can look at uh, uh, the development of different uh, vehicles for running on different soils. So what's my focus? My focus is on materials, especially, and manufacturing. And in a t materials aspect, I, I like to think of the top five materials in the world, which are steel, cement, plastics, paper, and aluminium, or aluminum if you're American. And, or Canadian. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> North American, I should say. Um, so, uh, why am I interested in those? I, I, I've, I started off by saying I was interested in, in, in energy and energy in materials and energy in foundries in particular. You've seen my, my CV. Uh, I, if you haven't read it, it's in, in the paperwork and I've worked a lot with the foundry industry. But essentially, the reason that I'm interested in these materials is because 
Of those materials, they, presume, they produce 20% of all the global emissions and energy use in, in, in the world. So that's, fa that's a huge amount. 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent a year. And the other thing that's interesting is that in that, aluminium is something like five times more energy intensive than steel and has an average lifetime of 21 years as opposed to 34 years. If I look at this table, which is produced by uh, a colleague at, um, in Cambridge University, uh, Allwood, uh, and, and we can see here where, uh, what amount of production we have of materials. So we make more cement than anything else. We also make a large amount of steel, 1.4 billion tons a year, and a lot of that steel goes into the cement to make it strong enough to be able to build uh, uh, and use in construction. Plastics is relatively high, 230 million tons a year, and down here we see 70 million tons a year of aluminium, roughly. But if you look at the energy intensity, I think that's rather interesting, and also the carbon intensity. So the, car the energy intensity this was pub that was published, this is about 2010, this work, um, 170 gigajoules per tonne of, of, of energy produce to, to produce aluminium, and steel, 35 gigajoules per, per tonne. So this is when I started thinking, this is interesting, this is, uh, this is fascinating, not many people think about it in these terms. All the, all the figures that I've ever heard, I'd ever seen before were considerably less than that for the aluminium. So I started doing a bit of digging. And also the other interesting thing was this carbon dioxide intensity. So this is amount of tons of carbon dioxide for every ton of material produced. And here we have aluminium at 10 and steel at 3, or iron products at 3. So, Let's leave that for a little and just tell you about, about some of the research because I'm interested in energy. I've been funded on research projects for the foundry industry and EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, has funded me on uh, a couple of projects, one on called, called Reducing Energy in the Foundry Industry where I got a, about three quarters of a million pounds for a three, three and a half year project where I was looking at how to um, develop more disruptive technology specifically in the aluminium sector. I then looked at, um, I then won some money fairly recently on a project I call Small is Beautiful, which is actually looking at our whole philosophy within the liquid metal area and the foundry sector about, about production rates and production volumes and the way we think about manufacturing in the foundry industry and potentially introducing new types of philosophies and guidelines for making product by liquid metal processes. And that was funded, uh, until the end of this year, so I have funding until December the 31st this year. Um, I, I've also just put in some funding on looking at reducing energy and materials processing for the whole of the UK with six other universities, uh, and uh, uh, another uh, project on looking at aircraft design and the circular economy. Uh, if you don't know anything about the circular economy, I can talk about that to you after the meeting if you wish to find out about that. And... Uh, I'm also, I've been invited to uh, put a, pro, uh, a proposal in for a follow-up study on Small is Beautiful. Um, so Small is Beautiful Part 2 to extend the research work. So you can see I'm funded quite well by the government to, do, to look at energy. If I look at the, I now come back to looking at some of the research results that have come out of the, re, the research I've done. If I look at... Uh, the metal flow in a typical aluminium foundry. Um, we saw the graphic at the beginning. This is the sort of thing that we have, uh, we, we produce. This is a Sankey diagram. And essentially what we're doing is we, we start off with, say, for example, if we're wanting to melt a ton of material, we start off with some raw material, uh, which comes from maybe recycled aluminium or uh, very, usually in the foundry sector, in the aluminium foundry sector, it's recycled aluminium. Uh, which has been used in some other process. So it might come from cans or it might come from the aircraft industry and recycled by a secondary remelter and then supplied to the industry in ingot. And then um, internally, we might recycle something as high as 60% of our material in the industry. Uh, this is in the aluminium sector. And eventually we get some good castings at the end. And that, in terms of what we've melted, 
is what I call our operational materials efficiency. Um, uh, and in, in, an, in, in an average foundry, um, that might be as low as 27%. Um, so I started looking at different types of foundry. I started looking at automotive foundries and comparing automotive foundries with aerospace foundries and also a foundry that might use uh, some disruptive technology, which is the technology I've been uh, trying to develop in, in one area. And um, so this is, this is the what I call the um, uh, materials energy burden, which is the amount of energy that's uh, taken into the process uh, having, um, having been manufactured come from the primary sector. And this is our operating materials efficiency. And if you multiply the two together, or sorry, divide one by the other, you get a process energy burden. So you divide the MEB by the OME, uh, and you get a process energy burden of gigajoules per tonne of good material. So how much energy does it take to get uh, a tonne of good castings? And, and this is what I find. That the automotive sector in general may be about 100 gigajoules per tonne. This is for, for uh, aluminium. Uh, with aerospace, um, if they were to recycle their aluminium, then they might get it down to as low as 250, 260 gigajoules per tonne. But in actual fact, the truth is that the aerospace industry does not recycle its aluminium. It, uh, it goes back down, it gets downgraded, let's say, into the automotive sector. Um, it doesn't go back into the, uh, into the aerospace sector. So they only use primary aluminium. And because their materials efficiency is so low, for example, an aircraft wing might be machined out of a, a massive slab of aluminium and only be left with 95%, uh, left with 5% of the original material that they started with. So they machine away 95% of the material by the time you've got to the finished product. That's a really dreadful situation, isn't it? You'd think that somebody would develop a different process to, to manufacture airplane wings. Well, they have. They've manufactured plastic ones. But as a metallurgist, I'm not sure I really like plastic wings either. So um, you can see that if you then start to look at the, the sort of more disruptive processes, which is a process I've developed called Crimson, you might be able to reduce the energy burdens by, by some considerable amounts over these traditional processings. And these results are all published in papers that you can read from the internet that I've published in, in various places. <clears throat> so one of the things that this has done, and one of the things that this research stirred up, and one of the things that I found from the reading, from the reading of the uh, Allwood book from Cambridge, was this concept of embodied energy, which is the amount of energy that it actually takes to produce uh, a, a ton of material in the first place. And we saw the figures quite high for aluminium, about 200 gigajoules per ton of that order. Um, and, the, and for iron products, about 20 to 25 gigajoules per ton, as you can see in there. And uh, Allwood uh, and Cullen also produce uh, some figures called the apparent efficiency of production. And if you look at that, actually aluminium is not bad compared with some of the other materials but it's still not so good as iron. Um, this brings me back to a story I, I should tell you. When I, when I was a, a PhD student, I went to a summer school as a demonstrator uh, for the Open University. And there, there was a guru giving a, giving a, a, a lecture um, uh, on sustainability. This was in 1982, let me say. So this is some years ago. And um, he'd written a textbook that I'd read as an 18-year-old. And so I, of course, went to this lecture because I had to meet this, this very famous person. And he said, you know, plastic buckets are so unsustainable. We should all be going back to steel buckets which are galvanized. And in, in terms of sustainability, he's actually completely right. Because if you look at the energy and the amount of the ability to recycle and to, uh, and to go through the process many times, steel is far better than polymers. Of course, it does cut your design process a little, and maybe you don't get such neat design, but it's certainly from a sustainability and energy point of view, better to have a galvanized steel bucket than a plastic one. So I can see you all going away and changing your buckets now. They hurt more when you kick them, though. <laughs> so 
so I started thinking about this in terms of the automotive sector. And I'm thinking, well, there's a great push towards light weighting. Light weighting in the industry for the average designer means using lower density materials. It's not really light weighting, is it? It's just saying, well, I'll substitute one material with a lower density than another uh, without taking into consideration things like the specific strength. For example, if you think about what you're getting for your, your pound of material, you get three times as much strength per pound for, uh, or for, per kilogram, I should say, um, of material for, uh, for steel than you do from aluminium. So if you look at specific strengths and specific properties, then actually steel and aluminium are pretty close. You, you, and specific stiffness is very similar. So if you want to make something stiff, uh, then, then you, um, th then you can use a third of the amount of steel and, and uh, than you do aluminium in terms of, of the amount of material. So I started looking at uh, some research, and I found this very interesting paper in two th from 2008 from uh, a very eminent uh, fellow of the Royal Society in the UK, Professor Mike Ashby from Cambridge University, who'd used an eco-audit tool to substitute uh, the bumper. We call it a bumper in, in England. Uh, I think in North America you'd call it a fender, uh, this is the bit that you crash into people with, or you crash into other cars with, uh, or try not to, I should say. Um, and if you sub if you substitute a steel bumper with an aluminium bumper, uh, you have to substitute it for with uh, a 10 kilogram uh, amount of aluminium to get the strength. Uh, and the original steel bumper is about 14 kilograms for the same strength and toughness. And this particular study found that the break-even distance for that substitution was something like 200,000 kilometers. So you have to drive the car 200,000 kilometers before you get the benefit of that four kilogram weight setting. That's, that's a lot of driving. That's pretty much about as far as most cars drive. So you get to the end of its life and it's just about substituted. It's, it's just about got to the point where it's broke, broken even. Well, that's, that's, that really started to make me question things. And it's all to do with this embodied energy. And you look at the embodied energy of aluminium, it's very high, and the embodied energy of steel is, 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 is much lower. And plastics, I mean, a lot of bumpers nowadays are made of plastics, and yet you look at their embodied energy, and they're incredibly high. Uh, not as high as the aluminium, but they're still very high. So you have to question whether even plastic substitution is good. And then I started looking at this, which was another um, graphic which was reduced from the eco-audit tool or from the, the software that creates the eco-audit, which is developed by Professor Ashby in Cambridge. And this is a plot of strength against embodied energy. Now, this is quite a complex plot, uh, and I don't expect you to understand it all, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in uh, so that you can see just the metals part rather than the polymers or the non-technical ceramics and all these things. This is a whole series of different different materials. Do we look at the the metals, which is this this tri this sort of ellipsy thing here? And if you look, what we're trying to do, if I go back just one, what we're trying to do is we want the best position is to have the highest strength with the lowest embodied energy. That's what we want to do from a sustainability point of view. Is we want to be in this top left-hand corner where there's no materials in the top left-hand corner. So we have to do, we have to deal with what materials we can. So we want to have as high uh, strength as possible and to the left hand side as much as possible. So if we're just talking about metals, let's go into the zoom and we look at the left hand side of this part and the highest amount. My goodness, what's there? Cast iron. That's amazing. That's fantastic. But it's a, it's a pretty long loop. Then we look across and where we've got uh, silicon nitride as a ceramic. We've got uh, stainless steels here. And then we've got over here, we've got aluminium alloys. So actually, far to the right and not as high. So they're not as strong per for every unit of energy that they have involved in their manufacture, which is really rather interesting. And actually, if you look at the cast irons, this will cover grey cast iron and everything else and I suspect, although I haven't done the research work yet, but I will be doing, is that the CGI will be somewhere in the top of that ellipse. 
but it would be nice to put a dot there for CGI uh, in the future, which I do intend to do. <clears throat> so, what the other thing I'm wanting to do is trying to understand a little bit more about the foundry sector and about foundry processing. And so we've been also looking at how we can represent energy and materials flows throughout the foundry. That's a fairly complicated graph or uh, schematic, but it does show very clearly how we have energy delivery here, which may be electricity, gas, oil, into a, a, into a plant. We've got materials delivery and materials recycling from the process and how the material flows through the processing and how at each stage we have energy uh, being used at each of the processing stages. What I am doing at the moment is I'm developing a tool through the Small is Beautiful project to actually get this so that it links and represents real data from real foundries so that at the end a foundry would be able to take the tool and re represent its process with all the energy flows, with all the material flows in a way like this so they can really understand where their hotspots are and they can save energy by looking at those hotspots and doing the research around those hotspots. I mentioned the uh, Volvo Schervda plant because this is one of my benchmarks in terms of how much energy is used in the process. Um, they used one of the very lowest amounts of, uh, of energy for m m that is used for melting a ton of cast iron. Um, only an extra... Uh, 40 kilowatt hours per ton over and above the melting material was used within the foundry when I went to, I went to visit them last December. Um, one of the unfortunate things is that they haven't done an embedded energy um, calculation, and that's one of the things I would like to do on their plant as well, to get an embedded energy uh, uh, process uh, done to see whether it's really as good as they claim. So... Another part of what I was doing at, uh, with the Small is Beautiful project was to travel around to various uh, exhibitions and conferences to, to, to discuss with colleagues and friends in the foundry industry. And that's where I saw uh, a very interesting presentation uh, on very thin-walled um, cylinder blocks for the automotive sector, for passenger cars. And... Uh, the foundry that presented this came up with uh, this, these figures here, which I was quite interested with because it was slightly different from the sorts of figures that I was getting, uh, that I was used to. You know, it had cast iron as 2.03 uh, kilowatt hours per ton, and primary aluminium as 32.7 kilowatt hours per ton, secondary aluminium 5.7. So they were, they, but, but they, they sort of didn't really go into the analysis in a way in which I thought was, um, was, was good enough because they'd mixed up primary aluminium and secondary aluminium and I knew that primary aluminium wasn't really used in the foundry sector and really we shouldn't be looking at, at, at that as a comparison with the cast iron. We should somehow do a proper study. And I, I walked out of that presentation and I bumped into somebody. <laughs> Sorry. Steve. <laughs> and, uh, I'd heard of Steve before, but I hadn't met him, and we had a very... I'd asked some questions in this presentation, and Steve had asked some questions, and so we, we got together, uh, and we decided that perhaps we should do some research together to look at this whole question of comparing cast iron and aluminium in cylinder blocks, because this presentation had both had stimulated both our interests. So I suggested that this is something that we could do quite... Easy, well, not easily, but we should be doing because we, we, I'd already had a PhD student who'd gone through the process of looking at the, 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 the processing within the foundry sector from the mining, from the start of mining all the way through to the finished product. And if you can see, I know this is a very busy, busy slide, but if you look at here, we have the, the, the bauxite mining, we have the alumina production, we have the electrolysis, the caustic soda production, limestone calcination, limestone mining, all of the things that go into producing aluminium until you all get all the way down to here, the final uh, landfill of some product. Uh, we have the, the, the mould-making side. 
And this is all published in 2013. In fact, if you, if you want to read any more about this, it's all completely available on the internet. Uh, and this chart is in his PhD thesis published in 2013. Um, one of the interesting things he doesn't talk about is, although there's a red line there, it doesn't talk about um, the, the, the product that is uh, coming out of the aluminium, uh, which is called red mud. For every tonne of aluminium that's produced, you produce two tonnes of what's called red mud. Now, red mud is a highly caustic pH 13, 14 alkaline uh, material, uh, basically some sort of aluminum mixture, uh, which is just dumped, and there is no use for it whatsoever. So there are ponds of red mud, potentially environmentally dangerous, produced... Uh, every year. Uh, in fact, 120 million tons of red mud is produced every year because we produce something like 60, 65 million tons of, of aluminium every year. Uh, so there's an environmental issue that we haven't addressed in the, in the materials world. And it's something that although there has been some research on, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the, 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 f the feedback I've got from various people who've worked in that area is that they have found a use for something like 2,000 tons a year, which is uh, peanuts, let's say, in comparison to the 120 million tons a year that's produced. So, in discussion with Steve, we decided that there was definitely the need for setting up a, um, a research project to tell the story, to potentially helpfully influence uh, car manufacturers and possibly other people, which would be a technical story, looking at the mining, the primary smelting, the foundry production, heat treatment, machining, on the road, um, and recycling. So not just the tailpipe. This is looking at the whole process in the automotive sector. But as well as the technical side, we should look at the business side, the legislation, engine weight benchmarking, engine trends, cost comparisons, things like price volatility, and legislation recommendations. So at the end, we would be able to say and be able to distribute this research in a way that will hopefully influence the legislators and be able to lobby, um, lobby politicians, both in Europe and also nationally. And internationally, I should say, not just Europe, let's say the world. So in Cranfield, we have a very... Interesting way of develop, of delivering our, our master's projects. We do all the teaching between, um, all the direct teaching, the lecturing, the stuff I'm doing now to you. Uh, we do that in four months. So we hammer them with, with lectures for four months. And then we put them on projects for eight months. And the eight months projects are all with industry. They are all sponsored by industry. So they're real life, uh, real issues. And in this case, I was able to persuade Steve that it was worthwhile spending uh, the time and effort that he, he has done with me over the last few months uh, running this project, uh, looking at um, this, this issue. I think Steve was quite skeptical initially that we could do this in three months. I must be a better salesman than I thought because I did persuade him uh, to support this project. Uh, because I was confident that my students would be capable of doing it. They are very good students. And I had done this the previous two years with companies, and every company I've worked with uh, was very positive about the group project reports that they can, that, and the results that come out. So we found seven students, a mixture of management students and material or management engineering students, I should say. So there's sort of a mixture of processing and manufacturing and also material students. And within three months, they're going to produce 21 person hours of work or person months of work. And they really do work very hard. Uh, I was getting emails, as was Steve, at three o'clock in the morning. It was a very impressive uh, bunch of students who worked together incredibly well. They took a little time gelling, but very quickly managed to work as a team. Um, and they contacted foundries throughout the world in cast iron and the aluminium sectors. They also cont contacted companies in the supply chain, including those involved in mining, metal supply, 
furnace manufacturers, heat treatment, recycling, machining, impregnation. And that's a lot. We contacted over a hundred different people um, and they got direct feedback from a hundred people across the world. In fact, one of the things they did in their presentation was to show a map of the world and all the contacts that they had, and it was very impressive. Um, and um, I'm very pleased with, with this particular research pro program, and I know Steve is as well. And the report, the data, and the paper will av be available later in the year. It's not available at the moment. So in my best Swedish, I can say... <laughs> Or as we say, or should, you want me to pronounce it, Holutik Eftevora Resultat. Or watch this space, as we say in English. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr.